been a little different. I don't think it's quite as crowded yet as uh, anticipated to be, but I think probably there'll be some more folks show up. But uh, because of this event, really, uh, I just felt like it's a good opportunity uh, to take a break from our regularly uh, scheduled series through Hebrews and, and uh, bring us something relevant about the eclipse. And so uh, I'll try my best to do that today. But uh, we might wind up right back in Hebrews before we're done today. So uh, anyway, but uh, when I thought about this eclipse and um, you know, just, just this event in general, I, I've read quite a few different perspectives and, and some of it's been pretty interesting. Uh, I've really been amazed uh, at a lot of what I've read because it reveals the glory of God <coughs> that just surrounds this spectacular sight. You know? We serve an amazing God. Amen? Amen. Amen. I think about it. You know? And tomorrow, most of us will have an opportunity and a privilege to witness a spectacular event that is a result of the handiwork of God. Right. Our testimony will be with uh, David, uh, as he wrote in Psalm 19:1. The heaven, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims His hand. That will be our testimony. Amen. And so, you know, when, when God created our world, just like it's recorded in Genesis chapter 1, He planned out this event for our enjoyment and for His glory. Well, let's, give, let's give Him some glory for this. Amen. Let's give God some glory. Thank you, God. He didn't give us a boring world to live in. He gave us an exciting world to live in. And this is the sin curse verse. Just imagine what it was like before and what it's going to be like when he's done. Oh man, it gets me excited when I think about that. In Genesis chapter 1, we read this. It says, And God said, Let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. And let them be lights in the expanse of the heavens to give light upon the earth, and it was so. So these are some of the words we read about the account of the creation. And I want you to notice one of the reasons that stands out here to me in light of the eclipse is that he says the sun, moon, and stars are for signs. See that? And for signs. And, and um, you know, we, we think about, you know, they give us light, and, and you know, and, and they give us night and day, and, and so they give us seasons because of positioning and, and all this and different things, but, but signs, that, that's thrown in there. You notice that? And, and so, um, signs are important. We talked about signs a little bit last week when I started the message, and I really give this one a lot of thought at that point, but the signs are important. We talked about it a little bit last week. And, you know, the place where I work um, over at NGK, right outside my office, there's, there's this line. It's, it's, it's called the clean line. It's a place where we clean uh, copper uh, sheet, sheet metal. It's just ran through some baths and different things. And one of the first uh, process it goes through, it goes through a bath that's about 45% sulfuric acid. And, uh, and so uh, it's a pretty uh, corrosive chemical. You don't want to hit it on you. <laughs> and uh, you, know, you definitely don't want to stick your hand in there and, and uh, that kind of thing. And so it's, it's pretty dangerous. And, and I just hired some new maintenance guys a few weeks ago. And uh, I just walked by there one day and I looked and I looked and I thought, man, there, there are no signs. There's no signs saying that there's dangerous acid in here, you know? And, and, and so I thought, man, I, you know, I wonder if my guys even know because they've not really had to work on it yet. So I need to make sure they know. Now I looked, and there was somebody written with a Sharpie marker, you know, and it was pretty faded, and you had to get really close to see it, which might be a little dangerous. But I went to our HDH and that guy, and I told him what was going on. We had a program to have that submit. 
take the ideas and I said, I think we need to get some signs like this, you know, to put up out there because anybody that walks in unsuspecting may not realize how dangerous this bath is. And, uh, I mean, you know, when you see a sign like this, you know not to put your body parts in there, right? I mean, it's kind of giving you a little warning, so it helps. But without it, how do you know? And we don't have to fear, but we can be at peace. 
and we can live out our lives with the fulfillment of what God has in store for us, okay? So let's look at a couple of truths I think that we see definitely from Scripture. Number one is this. God planned this eclipse. Our sovereign God planned this eclipse before He ever created this, this world, okay? It, it's a plan invented by God. I, I want you to make sure you understand. I, I'm stating obvious you know, here, but uh, most of y'all realize this. And I've essentially I've already stated it, but I want to remind you that God is in control. And uh, that this event was planned by Him from creation for us to enjoy, all of us who are alive today. For, it's for us. It's for those of us who will see it and everybody who experiences it in whatever way they will. And we, we've already read a little bit in Genesis chapter 1, but in chapter 1, verses 16 through 18, it says this. It says, that uh, God made the, the two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night and the stars. And God set them in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth and to rule over the day and over the night and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. So every celestial being, and God created everything, didn't he? And man, I'll tell you what, you, you can't say it a lot of times here, but you know about where I grew up? out to Highway 68, out toward Mount Pisgah Douglas Church. And we get out on our farm on an island, there's not many clouds. Man, it's pretty awesome. You know? The stars and, you know, depending on where we are in rotation and alignment with the stars, I mean, it's just pretty awesome. You know, God created all those things. But do you realize this? God created the sun and it's exactly 400 times larger than the moon. But the moon is 400 times closer to the earth than the sun. So this is what makes the eclipse possible. He did that. Come on, right? I mean, you know, think about it. You know, exactly 400 times? Just by chance. That's right. I mean, you know. But, but, but. And I read that, that there's no other planet in our solar system that this phenomenon occurs <coughs> in view of. No, nowhere else in our solar system, in our galaxy, that I'm aware of, can you see an eclipse of the sun? Just for us. Just for us. God did that. Man, you know, and, and, and so thank you, Lord, right, for your amazing hand. I'll tell you, the, the city of Sweetwater has been planning this event. I, I noticed that last night that uh, Hugh McCampbell and, and uh, I forget the other guy's name, they, they realized it was coming up, and they went down to the city office, city hall, on April 1st last year and made sure they were aware of it so we could take advantage of it and plan, you know, uh, because they realized Sweetwater was right in the line of totality, right close to the interstate. And uh, so uh, they started planning early April last year, so, you know, 16, 18 months, something like that, they've been planning for this, and, and uh, you know, it's really gotten crazy like that, and I mean, I mean, yesterday, I was thinking down, and I thought, well, I hope nobody needs to park anywhere down here, because you can't park down here today, I don't know what's going on, but you know, I've seen advertisements for parking places, you know, $50, $200, people rent out rooms in their homes, all the hotels are booked up, I mean, you know, the, the marathon down here, I mean, they, they're so stocked, they got, you can't even walk through the place. I mean, they got stuff in the aisles, you know, I'm like, man, you know, uh, but they're expecting to run out. I mean, you know, so it's been really crazy. Um, Christy talked to our neighbors, uh, Dr. Hugh McCampbell, and uh, he, uh, he said they're going to have 30 people at their house tomorrow to watch this thing. And, and uh, but they got these huge trees, so Christy's like, well, where are y'all going to watch it at? And he was like, well, you know, we thought we'd come over to your yard. <laughs> so, uh, anyways, which is, which is fine, but, but uh, you know, so, so it's getting pretty crazy. Um, but, you know, a year is a long time to plan something. You know, you think it's a long time. And they've been doing it for about a year and a half. But listen, God planned this from eternity. You know, this is His. This, this thing don't belong to sweet water. You know, this belongs to God. He deserves the glory for it. You know, and, and this eclipse is not alone in God's plan. You know, God has planned every eclipse that has ever occurred. 
and all those that will occur in the future, those are planned by God. And um, our God is sovereign. Nothing takes place without His knowledge. And He's in control. He's either directly in control or He's indirectly in control of everything. And so although the evil and the bad things that happened to you, God didn't cause those things. But they didn't surprise him. You know? And he wants to use those things to draw you to him and to restore you and, and, and for, for you to use those things for his glory to help others. And so everything that you've been through in life, whether it's really bad, whether it's really good, God's in control. And he wants, he wants you to trust Him. He wants to use those things. God used the cruel treatment of Jesus and His sacrifice and death to redeem us from our own sins. And He can use whatever it is you've suffered through to use you if you let Him. And so if God can plan the eclipse, He can plan the eclipse. So I want to encourage you to have faith. Regardless of what happens with this eclipse, regardless of what happens in your life, know that God has your best interests in mind and at heart. And He's working out all things in this world for good. For those that love Him, those that are His, have faith in God. Have faith in God. He's on His throne. Have faith in God. He watches over His own. Have faith in God. He cannot fail. He must prevail. Have faith in God. Have faith in God. And so one thing we can know about this eclipse is that it's a plan to be our sovereign God. And it's on purpose, right? So... Another truth we can learn from Scripture is this. This one may surprise you. It may scare you. This is what I found in Scripture. Eclipse events in Scripture always accompany divine judgment. Every one I saw that I believe could definitely be contributed to an eclipse, you always see divine judgment. I think maybe God may be trying to tell us. And so, Here's what I did. I just went through Scripture. I, I tried to find all these events in Scripture that could be eclipses. And, and I'm not 100% sure I got them all, but I, but I ran across a few that, that weren't recorded in Scripture, but possibly, you know, but they referred to events that happened in Scripture. You know, did you know, this is one thing I learned. There was a solar eclipse that happened over in Nineveh just before Jonah arrived to preach to them. Did you know that? I didn't know that. That's pretty cool. I'm about to add that to my number notes now. But, 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 uh, and so when Jonah got there, they were probably already terrified because God had given him this eclipse. He had given him this to see and, and they understood it. It was a sign of judgment. Not judgment. And here comes Jonah. God said if you didn't repent, he's going to destroy all y'all. They're like, okay, we're good. We're going to repent. We're going to do it. And, and that's what they did. The Bible says, you know, they repented in sake all the ashes. And so, so that was a good result. You know? Uh, but there, there's, there's other events in Scripture that we see quite a few times and, you know, that, uh, you know, that, that, uh, that may or may not be, be eclipses, but, but I want to focus on ones where I felt like they really were. Okay? And so, so uh, they all had, everyone I found, like I said, this, Divine judgment accompanied them. So I want you to read this from Isaiah chapter uh, 13. With me. So follow along with me. I, I want to read a little bit of detail in all of these accounts to help you get a little context so that you can understand the seriousness of what's taking place. <clears throat> so Isaiah the prophet wrote this. He said, The oracle concerning Babylon, which Isaiah the son of Amos saw, on a bare hill, raise a signal, cry aloud to them, wave the hand for them to enter the gates of the nobles. I myself have commanded my consecrated ones and have summoned my mighty men to execute my anger, my proudly exulting ones. The sound of a tumult is on the mountains of a great multitude. 
the sound of an uproar of the kingdoms of nations gathering together. The Lord of hosts is mustering a host for battle. They come from a distant land, from the end of the heavens, the Lord and the weapons of His indignation to destroy the whole land. Well, for the day of the Lord is near. As destruction from the Almighty, it will come. Therefore, all hands will be feeble and every human heart will melt. They will be dismayed. Pains and agony will seize them. They will be in anguish like a woman in labor. They look aghast at one another. Their faces will be aflame. Behold, the day of the Lord comes, cruel with wrath and fierce anger to make the land a desolation and to destroy its sinners from it. For the stars of the heavens and their constellations will not give their light. The sun will be dark at its rising, and the moon will not shed its light. I will punish the world for its evil and the wicked for their iniquity. I will put an end to the pomp of the arrogant and lay low the pompous pride of the ruthless. Does that sound like judgment to you? <laughs> yeah, obviously. You know, there's a lot of judgment in here. And in verse 10, you see this reference to the eclipse. And it seems like it was a, a what they call a sunrise eclipse, that, that maybe the sun was, you know, the moon probably bought the sun as it was rising, which is a rare event. But this context is full of judgment. The judgment mentioned here, it's against Babylon. And maybe you're maybe not you're familiar with Babylon. And I don't want to have to get I don't want to have time to get into a whole lot of detail here, but, but Babylon was one of the greatest enemies of Judah, of Israel, of, of the holy city Jerusalem. One of their greatest enemies. And Babylon has become has, has come to be a symbol uh, by, by uh, of all those nations that stand against God. You know, and, and prophets have used this, and end time prophecy speaks of a future Babylon that will also be judged and completely destroyed with the same intensity as described here, maybe even more. And some believe the United States is that Babylon. I've read that quite a bit this week. Is it? I don't know. Could it be? Yeah, maybe. Yeah? <laughs> um, but here we see this eclipse accompanied. Uh, divine judgment. Now let's look at this passage in Ezekiel. Ezekiel 32, just two verses. The prophet writes, When I brought you out, I will cover the heavens and make their sky scot the uh, I will make their stars dark. I will cover the sun with a cloud, and the moon shall not give its light. All the bright lights of heaven will I make dark over you and put darkness on your land, declares the Lord God. Now, when I first saw this and I saw the sun blocked by clouds, I thought, well, it's not really a cliff, but, but you know, this is just a cloudy day, maybe. But, but there's more going on here than that. You know, and I'm not sure exactly what all it is. But what we do see is Ezekiel, he's also a prophet. He's, here he's foretelling the destruction of Israel, and he's, he seems to indicate a judgment by God upon those who would destroy his people. It's an obvious description of judgment. And we see that we see that in verse 7, when I blot you out right from the beginning, that definitely sounds like divine judgment. And, and while I'm not certain this is a, a reference to an eclipse of the sun by the moon, there's definitely some unusual darkness taking place here, some kind of eclipse, lights in the sky being covered. And again, we see uh, some type of eclipse associated here with judgment of God upon Gentiles. That's what we see. Okay? Now let's turn to Joel. Well, this is a good one, you know. I mean, and, and, and this one has a has definitely has a forward prophetic uh, application to it to our day. And um, so, read it with me. It, it's uh, Joel two twenty eight through thirty two. And God's word says, and it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions. Even on the male and female servants in those days, I will pour out my spirit. And I will show wonders in the heavens and on the earth, blood and fire and columns of smoke, and the sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the great and awesome day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now that's good news, amen? 
and for in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there shall be those who escape as the Lord has said and among the survivors shall be those whom the Lord calls. Now notice here in this text the sun shall be turned to darkness the moon to blood before that great and awesome day of the Lord. Y'all see that? The day of the Lord was a present reference to judgment with a plague of locusts. But its future reference usually is tied to the great tribulation period that Scripture points to and we still look forward to today. Meaning, you know, it's not occurred yet. And he says in verse 30, the Lord will show His signs in the heavens. And in verse 31, the sun will be turned to darkness before that great and awesome day of the Lord comes. You see, this is one of the primary Scriptures that folks point to with this eclipse saying it's a precursor to the tribulation period that we've all probably grown up hearing about. And you know, in the rapture of the church and the return of Christ. And there's a lot of others who don't see it that way. But you know what I say to you? I say, be ready. Be ready. Because Jesus don't need no eclipse to come back. We don't know how God has it all planned. I'll tell you, when I read a lot of this stuff, and I'm easily swayed a lot of times, especially at first glance, it, a lot of it makes sense. You know, and a lot of it makes sense. I'm just telling you. And, and so I thought, man, but, but uh, we've got to be ready. Are you ready today if this is a sign that the great tribulation is about to begin and that Jesus is coming for his church? Are you ready today to go through with Jesus? Listen to me. If that scares you, you're not ready. If you're ready, you're going to bring it on, baby. I'm ready, right? But if you're not ready, you're terrified about it. That's how you can answer that question if you're ready. But the great thing about it is you can, make, you can be ready. Right now, all right? You just call out to Jesus. Now, I want, I want to show you a, a, couple, a few more real quickly. Matt, Matthew and Mark record this. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. And I think this, these passages here that they're talking about refer exactly to the same time that Joel's talking about. And then you go to Revelation and you read in chapter 6. And I'm not going uh, to read all this, but, but um, it says the sun became black as sackcloth, the moon became like blood and all these things. And, and, uh, you know, it's the great day of wrath. And there are other references in Scripture that might reference an eclipse, but these, I believe, are undoubtedly some sort of eclipse that Scripture refers to here. And you can look at them all, and every one of them are accompanied by judgment of God. That's my point. That's what I want you to see. Every eclipse in Scripture. Now, one more I want to share with you. I think it may be one of the most important. It's found in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. We're going to read Mark's account. Jesus is on the cross. He's being crucified. And Mark writes in chapter 15, verse 33 and 34, When the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. Which means, my God, my God, I do you You see, now, I read this week, and I didn't document it, so I can't tell you where I'm probably going to find it again. But I read this week that there was a confirmed eclipse over Jerusalem during the crucifixion of Jesus. But up until 1981, nobody knew that. But somehow the science changed and they confirmed that there was. But, and so, you know, and so I think it was an eclipse here. Okay, maybe, maybe not. But a lot of people say well, it could be an eclipse. It lasted from the sixth hour to the ninth hour. That's three hours. No eclipse happens for three hours. It only lasts for three minutes. What time does the eclipse start tomorrow? About one o'clock. What time does it end? About four o'clock. How long is that? That's about three hours. Now, that's my explanation, folks. Now, I don't know if it's a good one or not. Uh, but God don't need that to make it dark for three hours. I'll tell you that. Uh, and I don't really know how to resolve it with science other than that, except maybe there's some kind of translation error or whatever, or, or there are other periods of darkness or some other kind of eclipse we don't even know about yet, right? I mean, I don't, I don't know. But here's the thing. Here's what I want you to understand. The darkness that occurred that day, it wasn't just creation, feeling sorry for the Creator. No, that's not what it was. 
it was a sign of God's judgment. It was a separation of God from His creation because of sin. You see, on that day, the sin of all mankind was placed upon Jesus. And it was judged by God. God's wrath, His full wrath, was poured out on the only one who never sinned for you and me. That was God's judgment day for our sin. That's what it means. God's judgment was being poured out during the time when Jesus was your substitute. It was judgment for the whole world. You see, darkness is a sign of the absence of God and total judgment. And every occurrence of an eclipse recorded in Scripture is accomplished by divine judgment. You know, when I visit people at night, when I come up to their homes, one of the things I look for is the interior lighting. You know? I try to look if the lights are on. Because if the lights are on, that used to mean somebody's there and they're up. Because when you come to my house and it's late, you know, if there's no lights on, we're either in bed or we're not home. Some of y'all leave your lights on all the time. I don't know what you're doing in here. <laughs> you know, I don't know whether you're home or not. But, but anyway, here's the deal. You know, the lights indicate something. That you're home and you're available. <laughs> and folks, God reminds us that He is light. <coughs> that He is home. And He's ready. And He's waiting for you. And when the darkness comes, it reminds us of the absence of God's presence. And when there's judgment, the presence of God is removed. The evil has its way. And people suffer. The truth about the eclipse is that God has planned it. Damn, it's a sign of divine judgment. Because when you see that eclipse take place, you see the light. And then there's darkness. But the darkness can't overtake the light. <laughs> there's always a little remnant. And the light always returns. Think about that for a minute. You know, God's trying to tell us something, I believe. Remember this from last week, Hebrews chapter 9, verses 27 and 28. Jeremy mentioned it, I think, during his prayer this morning. It's appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment. Christ, being offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are waiting on Him. Folks, be ready. This is what the eclipse is about. There's a judgment coming. And Jesus is coming. We've got to be ready. You hear me? That's what this is about. And, 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 and so, there's a day of judgment coming. Because of sin, we all have this appointed time of death. The only people who will not see death are those believers who are alive when the rapture takes place and the church is called out. Everyone else has an appointment with death. And we will all stand before Christ in judgment. Eclipse or no eclipse, we need to get ready for judgment day by believing and trusting in Jesus. Are you ready? Harry was a caretaker of a recreation lodge on Spirit Lake. About, he was about five miles north of Mount St. Helens. Y'all remember that place? Two months there had been a series of small earthquakes and steam venting itself out of the volcano located there in Washington <laughs> State at this mountain. And, and all the evidence predicted that this great mountain was going to erupt with fury and just flatten the force. The rangers urged Harry to evacuate, but he wouldn't listen. Some of his neighbors begged him, you know, when they were leaving to come with him, his sister pleaded with him to be sensible, but he, he ignored every warning. He ignored every sign. He said this. He said, nobody knows more about this mountain than Harry, and it ain't going to blow up on him. That's what he said. But you have to wonder, in that fraction of a second, after Mount St. Helens mega nuclear type explosion took place on May 18, 1980, 
was thrown in dust and debris and everything that it had in its path up to 80,000 feet in the air. I remember the dust clouds coming by our place. <laughs> oh man, if Harry, you wonder, did Harry regret that he didn't pay attention to the signs? <laughs> and he, along with 56 other people, like it. Caught in that blast. A level, that blast leveled all those woodlands, took the trees and made them like two pigs for hundreds of square miles, a tsunami of ash and mud that buried his cabin and his perfectly mowed lawn. And it was the worst volcanic eruption in the United States history. Terry had all the signs he needed to escape the wrath of that mountain. And he stubbornly refused to heed those warnings. So I want to tell you this morning. Is the United States going to be judged next week or next year or whenever? I, is Jesus coming back today? He could. You know? What I want to tell you is don't ignore it. There is judgment coming. And your only hope is in Jesus. Your only hope is in Him. From the beginning of creation, according to John chapter 1, you read about the light and the darkness, and Jesus is the light. From the beginning of creation, the darkness has tried to overtake the light. Every night, darkness comes, but every morning, the sun rises, and the darkness disappears. Time to time we have an eclipse and the moon hides the sun for a few minutes only to see the light resurface. The sign designed by God to remind us He's in control. And darkness will never win. You hear? You are safe if you're in Christ. You're safe in Him. Sin has eclipsed the light of your soul. And only the S-O-N can get rid of it. The Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, today, by grace through faith, the atoning sacrifice of Jesus, you can believe in Him, turn away from sin, and be saved from eternal darkness, eternal separation from God. In that, you can have the confidence to face any trial, any tribulation, any trouble that you're going through. With Jesus, you'll be okay. You hear me? No matter how tough it gets, He's with you. He's sharpening you. He wants to use you for His glory. That's this this so right now, some of you, the Lord speaking to your heart, some of you don't know if you're ready. You don't know, you're scared to death. So let's get that right right now. Let's all bow our hands and close our eyes.